Hello, Facebook. Uh, my name is Janelle Ross. I'm a reporter at NBC News Digital. Uh, I write for the BLK section, which means that I write a lot about race in a lot of different ways. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about a story that I wrote about banking deserts and more specifically about a very small Mississippi town that has no bank at all and uh, considers itself fortunate to have one ATM that costs less than $6 to use it. Um, I am going to be taking questions, so I'll talk just a little bit about uh, this story and then uh, sort of open up the floor to questions. Um, I guess I should say first off what a banking desert is, just to sort of set the stage. Um, a banking desert is a term that actually originated in Italy in the 19th century, but here in the United States is usually used to describe an area uh, where there is no bank, no traditional bank within a 10 mile radius. And what typically happens in banking deserts is that you see an influx of um, what some people would consider predatory financial services because no one can operate completely via app or without any kind of financial services. So you'll see an influx of check cashers, um, payday lenders, auto title lenders, et cetera, et cetera, that sort of step into the gap that is created. Um, now, with regard to the story that I wrote, I went to a small place in the Mississippi Delta the home um, or birthplace of B.B. King, Itabina, Mississippi. Uh, that is, it translates from the Choctaw language to home or camp in the woods. It was founded by a man who went on to become a Confederate general uh, and later a governor of the state of Mississippi who had a lot of slaves that he set to work building uh, first a large plantation and then a town that grew around it. Uh, this is, like much of the Delta, a community that is almost totally black and has a large or a very high poverty rate. And unfortunately in 2015, they also are a town that lost their only bank branch when Regions Bank decided that the dynamics of operating a branch um, didn't work for them. Um, as it was explained to me, a, to operate a branch cost at minimum $200,000, $250,000 a year. So of course, like any profit seeking business, they're looking to make that money back. Um, in this case, when Regents decided to pull out, they did, however, work closely with a credit union by the name of Hope Credit Union. It's a well-established credit union that has locations in 22 different cities across the Southeast, many of them in very low-income communities, some of them in bank deserts like Itabina. And uh, the bank um, actually gave the credit union uh, a building and some other resources, including an ATM, which is at the center of my story, where people are able to actually go and get cash with um, most often paying no fee, but um, always a fee lower than the fees that are available at ATMs at gas stations around the city. In those ATMs, you've got to be prepared to pay somewhere between a little over $5 and a little over $7 every time you use them. So you can imagine that really adds up. Um, I think that uh, the thing that is probably most important to understand about banking deserts is that they run directly afoul, ultimately, of one of the, not only the goals of um, sort of capitalism, but frankly, U.S. law, which requires banks to serve all kinds of communities. That means to both collect deposits and to lend money in all kinds of communities, because that is what keeps economies thriving. That is what allows people to open small businesses, to buy homes, to buy cars, etc. And when that goes away, what happens when a banking desert emerges, there's plenty of research on this, is that lending of critical types such as business lending and mortgage lending tends to decline for years after that bank goes away. So communities can really begin to fall apart. And all of this also comes to the fore because right now there is some discussion in Washington about possibly um, addressing, tweaking, possibly reforming, altering uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, which is the law that requires banks to operate in all kinds of communities. Um, and if people have questions about that, I can talk a little more about that, but I think I'll open the floor. And if there are questions, I'll certainly take them. Janelle, I'm seeing a lot of questions about um, how far do people who live in 
kid of being I have to drive to even get to a bank? Yeah, it's a great question. They've got to drive to the next nearest town, which is technically 10.8 miles away. Um, it is Greenwood, Mississippi. Um, and it is, you can imagine, I mean, 11 miles is not super long in terms of time, but that means you've got to have a car. You've got to have a car at this point if you live in Itabina to go to a full service grocery store, to go to a uh, any kind of medical specialist, to certainly to visit a full service bank. If you need to go inside of a bank and do anything, if you need to go through a bank drive through, if you need to go to your specific bank's ATM, you've got to go that 11 mile distance. Do you know about how big the population is in Itabina? It's about 1,800 people, a little more than that, but it's about 1,800 people, and it is, like many rural communities, um, declining. Um, even in the 2010 census, I think there were a little over 2,000 people, and they're down to about 1,800 people. They, the population is also older than average. There are some young people, but very few. Um, so some of that decline is just sheerly natural death. And some of it is um, people moving away because I had yet I did not meet a single young person who indicated that they planned to stay. I did meet a few people in their I'd say late thirties and forties who had every intention to stay, but that was I'd say a few people. And is the population the reason why like they just can't open a bank in this area? Because you would think if there's such high demand that you know they'd be able to open one, right? I, I think there are two sort of things to keep in mind here. One is. Um, you know, keep in mind that population decline in rural areas is not limited to Itabina. So the things that are happening in this town are happening in thousands of communities across the country. There are more than 1,200 banking deserts. So even if we just chalk this up to population decline, there is a need for some kind of solution. Second, of course, some of what has happened here is attributable to population decline. The city is losing its tax base. So the money just to do sort of fundamental public works is, you know, shrinking the plot pot of money, but also the population sort of concentrations that businesses look for when they want to say open a grocery store or open a bank branch are not there. So that is true that population decline is part of this story. However, there is, as I said, unlike, say, a grocery store, there is a U.S. law. There are, in fact, a couple of U.S. laws that do require banks um, to serve all kinds of communities. Basically, any place where they're collecting deposits, they should also be making loans. Um, and that is because lending is absolutely fundamental. I doubt there are many people who are watching this who have been able to purchase their home to start a business to do anything major um, of a financial type without some sort of interaction with a bank. That is just a reality. And if not a bank, an online lender, but nonetheless a lender, because very few of us simply have, you know, several hundred thousand to a few million dollars sitting around in order to um, buy a home or start some sort of business or initiate something that is going to ultimately generate jobs and tax revenue, which is what we need. And that is why that law exists for banks. On that note, you said that it's a pretty widespread issue. Do you know any other small towns where this might be, that might also be banking deserts? All right. What I will do after this is over is I will, if possible, I think it's going to be possible for me to put up a link. There is a report um, with a map um, of sorts. I can tell you this. Banking deserts are clustered in a, a couple of places. These are sort of the areas where they're most likely. One, they are more common out west and in the uh, sort of southwest where populations tend to be a little more sparse. Um, they are also much, much more common in low-income communities. And by low-income, I mean communities where incomes top out below $49,000 roughly. Um, and second, they are much more common in communities of color. Um, so that means that they are also heavily, heavily concentrated in areas where poverty has been a persistent generational problem. Jobs are a persistent generational problem. By that, I mean lack of jobs. And that means the Mississippi Delta. Uh, that means, uh, let's see, what is often referred to as Indian country. So areas where there are a lot of reservations. That is also meant Appalachia. Um, and then I'm forget oh, the colonias along the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Um, in terms of just day-to-day -day banking, how common are apps like Venmo and Zelle in these areas? Are people using online banking at all? I will tell you, there are a few people who are using um, apps like Venmo and Zelle. And I would say that in the course of my time there, I think I was there about a week, I met two people total. Um, of course, it is a small town. And as I said, the majority of the population, more than average, are over the age of 65. And I think we know that app use is a little lower. The, it, it, it falls off um, as you sort of climb the age scale. Um, and the long and short of it is no, they are not in common use at all. Um, that said, I, I think that like many things, um, probably give it two, three years and there probably will be greater ad adaption of Zelle or other apps, you know, Apple Pay, et cetera. However, I think this is something that was said to me that really helped to clarify something for me because I went in thinking, well, you know, it's not great not to have a bank, right? But I personally haven't been into my bank where I've been a customer since I was literally 17 years old. I have probably went in there one time last year because I was moving and I needed to get a cashier's check for my deposit of my apartment, right? So in my mind, I, you know, initially thought, well, it's not great not to have a bank branch, clearly, but you can do just about everything you need to do online. You can even open an account online. You know, I do all my banking basically through my own bank's app, right? However, the reality is that where you're doing major and significant transactions, let's say you need to buy a house, very few people, if they're doing that through their bank, are going to do that on an app, right? Number two, certainly where business lending is concerned, that is not done by app. Those decisions are very relationship-based, and you really need to build a relationship with your banker, understand what the bank standards are. And then finally, and most importantly, it, it, according to um, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC's most recent surveys, something like, I want to say this is off the top of my head, but I think something like more than half of Americans went into their personal bank branches more than 10 times last year. So it simply isn't the case that you can do everything via app. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, I think that the problem is not just the absence of the physical um, bank, but in the case of Edubina, I think it was made really clear to me that the most basic financial services, right? You need cash in your wallet because in this town, the only store that sells food in the center of town doesn't take cards. So you need cash in your wallet. Um, if you are a person who doesn't have a car and needs to get a ride, you know, to one of many nearby cities, you need cash in your wallet for that purpose. And just getting money out of an ATM becomes this extremely, uh, I would say, impoverishing adventure, right? If you're getting cash out of ATMs and gas stations that are charging you seven dollars every time you use them you can imagine you begin to go through your money pretty quickly so it is functionally not very practical not to have a bank we'll just do the last question here is there anything being done to help people in banking deserts or are we just letting the population climb yeah i think that there are two things i think in Total fairness regions would say that it went out of its way to make sure that um, the people of Edabina were going to at least have access to a credit union. And Edabina is fortunate in that it does have access to hope. It is right there in town. And about 40% of the population in town are members. So that gives you a sense of how badly it is needed. However, in most banking deserts, there is no credit union. There are various check cashers, et cetera, that are operating there or nearby there. Um, and with regard to what's being done, I think there are lots of people who are taking note of the issue, tracking the issue closely, taking note of the fact that the number of bank branches is just declining dramatically every year. We are down to about 88,000 branches in the United States um, in 2018. That's down from a high of 99,550 branches in 2009. And some of that, yes, is related to online migration, people using apps, et cetera. But what I think the one remaining thing is that there is discussion um, happening on both sides of this equation, civil rights organizations, consumer rights organizations, um, as well as the banking industry itself, about what kinds of adjustments might be need to might need to be made to the community reinvestment act to 
um, incentivize banks to uh, operate in places where um, I guess the sort of most basic incentive, you know, money is not there. Um, and then two, to attend to the needs of people who are living in communities around the country today. So for example, um, and this is a minor uh, example, but actually I shouldn't say it's minor, it's major. We've reached a point where the major, or I guess the company that issued the largest number of mortgages in the United States for at least the last two years, but perhaps a little bit more than that, is an online lender. They are an online only organization or company, and they are not a bank. So they are not subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. They are not subject to certain regulations that do affect banks. And there are a lot of people who think that perhaps they should be. And I think that's it. I don't know if anybody has anything else that they'd like to get to. Not seeing too much else. Okay. Well, um, I will just say thanks very much for tuning in. It's sort of exciting to see that people are interested in a, an economic topic that can feel a little bit um, ephemeral or obscure, um, but certainly has a real impact on people's lives. Okay.